Charlie Dimmock, Boys. the Rich Brothers, Jump. <laughs> and the Garden Rescue Team have a treat in store. Too much entertainment. They have come to the rescue of hundreds of British gardens. <laughs> now it's time to look back hey. and pick their favourites. This looks really cool. Oh, wow. 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 Look at that. <laughs> Fabulous. As they celebrate the very best. I don't like it. Huh? I love it. Oh. From extraordinary eco gardens. Thank you so much. <laughs> to exotic designs. Oh my gosh, no way. Gardens inspired by people. Is this the garden that you dreamed of? It is. Absolutely. <laughs> I think that's a thumbs up. And places. It's the most beautiful garden I've ever been in. Therapeutic spaces. Wow. And the most extraordinary transformations. Whoa. It is perfect. Yeah, <laughs> come on. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Welcome to, to Garden Rescue. Rescue. Top of the plots. <laughs> So, H, what have we got in store today? Whoa, today, it's all about the quirkiest gardens we've ever created. And look, already Charlie's <laughs> happy. Smiling, smiling. Quirk and Charlie. Love. <laughs> Anything a bit out there, a bit off the wall, quirky yeah. is, yeah. Give me a theme. Give me something to upcycle that's a bit <laughs> out there. I am happy, happy, happy. Yeah, wacky <laughs> and off the wall. Yeah. Definitely very happy. You can see it there. What are you, you saying about <laughs> me, David? <laughs> Grin ear to ear. And who remembers Vicky and Paul from Coventry? Oh, yeah. Who yeah. forget? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Pretty quirky garden, yeah. that, wasn't it? What a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> We're proud of all our incredible garden rescues, but our first top of the plot's quirky transformations was for Vicky and Paul. The couple fancied giving their space a festival vibe, but they also wanted to keep its quirkiest feature, a World War II air raid shelter. Still standing. Just about. We want to use it, yeah, tastefully in the garden for us to, you know, enjoy um, and a good, like, nod and wink at yeah. our, our past history. It's a talking point with your yeah. friends and neighbours, isn't it? Look what I've got in my garden, an air raid shelter. <laughs> <laughs> So Charlie's design focused on creating a boho chic chill out space that also made use of the old shelter as well as adding plenty of quirky features throughout. So you have your wonderful Anderson shelter, okay? So I've used that, but I have jacked it up slightly because if you want to get in, yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit like that. Got a little perch seat along the side of it. So it'll be very shady in this area. This is a wall but I've made it like a mishmash of so different cool. textures, a bit of planting on it, and it'll be places where you can, you know, like if you go to the beach and you bring back a... Memorabilia. Uh, yeah, you can just plonk it on there. First job for the landscapers is to clear the garden. Whilst Lee takes a look at the star of the show. Right, so here we are, this fantastic old Anderson shelter. I mean, what I love about this is the fact that it's got the old stenciling on from when it originally issued. Uh, but the problem we've got, which I've started addressing at the minute, is where it's been in the ground before it's, it's started to rot really badly. So what uh, Charlie's plans are is to cut all the rot off, coach bolt six posts to the base of it, and then we're going to turn it 90 degrees, take it further down the garden so it makes a fantastic shelter and hopefully avoids it from rotting in the future. With a new patio going down and the team winning against the weeds, the shape of the garden is beginning to emerge and the Rich Brothers are set to give the spruced up shelter a festival makeover. Lee's done an awesome job at cleaning it up so far. So what he's done is actually cut the rust off the bottom and then give him that a little sand so it's not sharp. Looks smarter, but actually he's made it a lot shorter. So he's hoisted it up on these legs here. And what we're going to do is position that, set it in, so it's a little bit shorter down. It's nice and sturdy, but still tall enough that you can enjoy being in here. And it's tired raining, so uh, no, nowhere better to be. Should we start to enjoy it already? Yeah. See, aren't I kind to you boys, giving you a job in the dry? <laughs> Me and Lee, our hair's going curly. <laughs> Lee's hair? Oh, look, see? <laughs> Lee's beard, you mean? <laughs> First of all, they mark out where the holes for its new legs need to go and then call for reinforcements. 
Right, we need some strong men. So should we get Carol, Steve, Guy? Should we just get Andy involved as well? Because oh, probably best. He might feel left out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, come on, Backstreet Boys. We're going backwards, basically. Uno. Mob handed, they move the shelter aside so they can dig those holes. Thanks, guys. With the shelter shaping up, Charlie gets started on constructing a fence at the bottom of the garden to screen off the shed, beginning with some timber battens. The blue colour is actually a preservative. Not green fingers, but blue fingers. But it certainly helps the garden's quirky festival feel. And once the blue slatted framework for the screen is in place, Charlie and Lee can start to add oddball features to give it added texture and individuality. You want the skull the right way up? I yeah. prefer the skull the other way up. You want it upside down? I do. Trust you. Why? Well, why is that? Because that opens the wrong way, doesn't it? Nice. I like that. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> And then if we've got something like this, I reckon, and then yeah. we can put a latch on it. Yeah. So, so, and yeah. then yeah. I think along the bottom, and then we've got some off-cut of tin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we're just going to make lots of rectangles and squares and fill them up with different things. Meanwhile, the Rich Brothers are making progress with cementing the Anderson Shelter's new feet into the ground. With the cement left to set, the boys move on to playing with sticks at the bottom of the garden. Like that's too, they're too close together, those points, aren't they? So that needs to go like that. Charlie's challenged them to come up with some decorative artwork for the shelter that will really make the festival theme sing. Charlie's letting us get in touch with our spiritual side, making this dream catcher. Inside here, this is where we're going to create that lovely webbed effect of the actual dream catcher. And in Native American folklore, traditionally, that's where the good dreams would filter through, but the bad ones would be caught in the web, and then you'd be, you know, happy dreams. Well, I need one of these, I think. I've been dreaming about Charlie bossing me around <laughs> the garden rescue. That's funny. I've been, I've been having the exact same dream. All right, well, I haven't made a dream catcher for a long, long time, so I'm hoping it's not going to be too difficult. The dream catcher will add to the laid-back, homespun party atmosphere Charlie's hoping to recreate for a couple who are so passionate about festivals. As will Charlie's memory wall screen at the back of the garden. All we now need, that shelf there and a little latch on the door. Oh, yeah. And that pot in there. Yeah. Super. And, and, yeah. and... Yeah, and my other arm. <laughs> <laughs> Which way up do you like it, mate? And, of course, the uniquely quirky World War II shelter. That's great, that. <laughs> this hippie chic garden is finally complete. Tidy. <laughs> What was an unloved, messy garden has now been transformed into a mini festival paradise. But what will Vicky and Paul make of their quirky new party space? Vicky, Paul, your garden, I have to say, was a bit Glastonbury, but on a bad day. <laughs> you can open your eyes now. I don't want to. You don't want to? <laughs> oh, my days. Oh, wow! <laughs> oh, it's so cool! Can't no. take it all in it. Let's <laughs> <laughs> shake it. Look at that. Oh, that's crazy. Oh. The boys made a lovely dream catcher yeah. for you. A little yeah, dream star. So cool. So exciting. So We've much. got a proper garden. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to start selling tickets. My very own garden <laughs> festival. Lovely. That tie does suit you there, Dave. I feel it's quite nice. festival, actually. Yeah, very nice. Would well, it? you can really see that we made Vicky and Paul's day with that one. Yeah. And if it's the festival vibe you're looking for, then you could always try something as simple as this rag bunting. Just some rough offcuts of old material, maybe some curtains, Harry's pants. Surprised he's got a lot lying around. And then it makes something really cheerful. 
and nice and decorative in your garden. Right, if I can untangle myself, we can... You're part of it now. Right, find the end. Got it. So we're just attaching it to this tree here. And that is just going to brighten up the corner of the garden. <laughs> there we are. Oh, it looks good, that, Dave. Beautiful. Look at that. Well, I think that definitely has a nice festival vibe. Really fun to make and great to do with children. Oh, I'll tell you what, all this shabby chic is looking pretty good. Yeah. Now, do you remember our next quirky garden with Paul and Lisa? Oh, stopped us in our tracks. Our next Top of the Plots quirky transformation was for Paul and Lisa in Havant. Their garden was nothing more than a building site. The last 18 months, we've had no garden to appreciate. If it had concrete mixes in it, it's definitely in dire need of a rescue. <laughs> but the couple had competing visions for their outside space. She wanted to relive Greek holidays in her back garden. He wanted to put his model railway in the plot. It's Paul's dream to have his railway in the garden, as he's been collecting it for many years now. And he just wants to be able to uh, get that out in the garden. Enjoy it. <laughs> but yeah, we both worked for the railway for over 30 years, so yeah. um, it, it's, it's a big railway family. The designers faced a Herculean task. But in the end, Charlie's Greek ruins vibe, coupled with a discreetly positioned train track, got the green light. I want to sort of create an almost a tumbled down farmhouse. And then I have popped in the train track there, through the lawn and the planting. It's amazing. Before Charlie can work her magic, the landscaping team arrive to get cracking on the chalk and cheese design. This is one of Charlie's, and it's rural Greece... All oh, right. ..meets the railway. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to do these ruins here, so it's like L-shaped walls right. made out of block, render. On the other side of the garden is where the railway comes in. Obviously, it's not a full-size railway. Should we give it a go? We're, we're going to have to be Greek gods on this one, aren't we? Well, you might be. Well, we're... Don't know about the rest of us, mate. Hold that. <laughs> We've got Zeus. <laughs> Central to Charlie's design is a tumble-down farmhouse made from rendered concrete walls. But before the bricks can be laid, there's some groundwork to do. With the area for the wall dug out, a semi-dry concrete mix is added and levelled. And then the bricklaying can begin. To add to the authenticity of her design, Charlie's recycling an old gate to create her ruined farmhouse windows. The kind of thing that you'd see in old Greek buildings or Spanish buildings along the Mediterranean. What a great use. Gonna work quite nicely, mate. With the windows in and a render of lightweight cement going on the walls, Charlie's Greek ruins are coming on a treat. And the Rich Brothers have arrived to get the railway rolling. When the train track goes in, we don't want it to move, and this is going to keep it really solid. And it also means that the gravel that's going in there isn't going to get kicked around the garden as much. The brothers click together 15 metres of plastic gravel trays, and along with the gravel, it comes in at 90 pounds. We have basically called on one of Paul's mates who has got his own train track. Because although David and Harry are going to put it together, we thought we'd better make sure we're getting it exactly right. So he's going to be our uh, train enthusiast. Well, there we are, gravel's all down. Looks ready. It's time to get the track in. Hello, Matt. Hello. The expert. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> this is what we need. <laughs> There we are, magic. That's the sweetest. Oh, that should be okay, shouldn't it? By the time we've moved some of that. Blimey, that's, that's going great. down fast. Then we need a we need a uh, type three. Here, guys. Here we are. This might help us out. You're you're starting to sound more and more excited, you boys. Yeah. Your voice <laughs> level. <laughs> now you're like, oh, you started off a bit like, uh, uh, but now you're getting, oh, 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 oh. The train track's on schedule, and Charlie's ready to add wow factor to her ruins. Look at that. 
Doesn't that say Greek islands? Here we go. It's... Oh, yeah. That is lovely. Wow. Does it say the blue skies of the Greek islands? Yeah, it does, yeah. I have to say, this blue is a very iconic blue of the Greek islands. We can... And the churches and the doorways. Can you imagine? One terracotta pot with a bright red geranium on it. Just says holidays, doesn't it? And if the weather's like this, they won't have to go to the Greek islands. Stay here. Have a staycation. Charlie also wants to bring the classic aromas of Greece into the garden, so she's planting a variety of aromatic herbs and other plants. Now, when you think of the Mediterranean regions and the Greek islands, there's certain plants that spring into your brain straight away. You think of aromatic plants like lavenders and cistus, you know, like the rock roses and the sun roses, and then you also think of grapevines, scented plants and pines and this is one of my favorite pines because pine trees a lot of them get quite big this is pinus mugo mops it still gets reasonably big but it gets a nice sort of gnarled shape to it and it stays fairly low and we're going to pop it in here so it sort of will screen the railway track but of course it's also got that aromatic smell of pine and being in the full sun you're really going to smell that the planting's nearly done, and the Garden Rescue Express is almost ready to depart. Charlie, I've made you a oh. cup, I've made you a cup of tea, so I thought that I could come over to you when you're painting down by there. Uh, okay. Oh, dream. Okay, wonderful. Matt, are we ready? You should be ready. Woo! Moment of truth. Yeah. yeah. That's it, nice and steady to start oh, with. Wow. Tea's nearly there, Charlie. Woo woo! It's fantastic. Thank you so much, Matt. That's, that's, that's made our right. life Not a problem. so much easier. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah, that made it a lot easier. I think that would have been stressful for us, to be honest. <laughs> and with that timely departure, the model railway come Greek Island Garden is done. It was nothing more than a building site, and now it's been transformed into this incredible quirky garden. But will it live up to Paul and Lisa's very different expectations? Mum's excited. Are you excited, Zia? Yeah. Yeah. Right, open your eyes. Oh, <laughs> my God! Amazing. Unbelievable. Wow. And the little train go. <laughs> <laughs> Definite reminder of holidays in Kos. The smells are just amazing. Um, yeah. Bring back lovely memories too. So, and uh, long may the sun continue. Yeah. <laughs> what a fun garden. Definitely quirky, or should I say, beautifully eccentric. Maybe not everybody's cup of tea, having a miniature railway line in the garden, but what people do love is that Mediterranean vibe. And you can get that using plants like this Pittosporum, a lovely evergreen shrub, glossy green leaves and sort of creamy white flowers that are just full of scent that is really highlighted come the evening time. Grasses with their waving seed heads and asphodels to give that spire of colour. It gets that a real evocative Mediterranean feel. We really enjoy being given a quirky brief, but equally, we do love coming up with a few ideas that the owner hasn't necessarily thought of themselves. And you think of what I'm on about. Mm, one springs to mind, Gareth from Birkenhead. Oh, nail on the head. And with that design, we definitely thought outside the box. <sighs> Gareth from Birkenhead was a bassoonist in the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra and the less-than-proud owner of an extremely challenging back garden. The main issues around the garden is the fact that it slopes 
a lot downwards and also to the sides. The patio area is useful, but then I find the lawn is not used at all. It's basically dead space. A cool design area is what I'm looking for, really. With a steep slope making half the garden unusable, the Rich Brothers had to come up with a quirky way to use the space. We want to do something really cool, really different, and extremely unique. So what we've done is we've put in, sat down into the, into the land, this cube, self-contained unit, that's level inside, but the land works around it. Uh, it's made out of Corten steel, so it's like steel that's been allowed to rust and oxidise. Brilliant. But before the boys' brilliant steel box could take pride of place in the garden, the landscaping team had to level the ground. Right, the sun's come out, let's dig. Right, steel's here then. We need all hands on deck to get this off. Weathered steel, sometimes known as Corten steel, has been oxidised to create a striking and protective rust-like surface. It has extra resistance to the elements, meaning low maintenance costs, and therefore it's perfect for a long-lasting outdoor structure. They've weathered all the outside for us. What with? Real weather? Yeah, real weather. You use real weather to weather it? Imported. With the ground prepped and all the pieces of the steel box in, the team can finally make a start on constructing Harry and David's very cool centrepiece, which will be accessed by an opening on one side. The garden's going really well. We've started welding the weather steel together, so the box is actually being created. As you can see down here, they're just putting the other corner on as well. So you can really start to feel the space, you get an idea of it. It's going to feel nice and enclosed, nice and cosy. And it's just something quite different. I really like it. And at the top of the garden, Charlie's hit on a way to introduce a bit of quirkiness of her own to the space. So all gardens have boundaries, whether it's a hedge or a fence. And the thing about fences is they're not a thing of beauty. And you can go sort of one or two ways. You either make it disappear, which Gareth has done down there, he's painted it sort of a black colour, so that you see the plants but you don't see the fence, or you embrace it and make it pop, which is what I'm going to do here. So uh, I'm going along the uh, route of Mondrian, the artist, you know, the blocks of colour, and we're going to use oranges and yellows, make it really vibrant, and it sort of lends itself because it's already got these bits of timber, but I might need to put a few more in, so I'm thinking, what about there? But it's important to choose the right colours if it's going to be a true work of art. Think about this, three colours. One, two... Because they can't be the same, can they? The steel box has been constructed, and now Harry and David are pinning it down. But what I'm doing now is I'm staking them from the bottom with a steel rod. And as you can see, the inside of these boxes are still silver, whereas the outside has been pre-rusted. So over time, this is going to rust and complement and be exactly the same as the outside. All right, a few more pegs for you, sir. Thank you very much. There you go. And also that patina, that rust, is the secret behind why it's used so much in industry and in architecture. Because what it's doing is it's reacting with the oxygen in the atmosphere, and that's creating the rust. But what weather steel has, the makeup of it, has the ability to control that rusting process. So as opposed to something like mild steel, what that does is that reacts, it rusts, and then it starts to flake and it starts to degrade down. Whereas weathered steel controls that, and you just get this kind of soft, powdery rust on the surface. And that'll continue for about two to three years. But then after that, it'll stabilise. And that means you've got this continual rust on it, continual protection. And what's so good about the weather steel is you don't need to paint it. As opposed to normal steel, like a mild steel, you will have to paint it, and that's something you have to repeat. So you'll have to constantly repeat to re protect it. So that's why weather steel is a perfect option. That's good, cos I'm fed up with painting. <laughs> Having mapped out her abstract artwork, Charlie's now putting paint to fence. Right, I'm going to leave those four for yeah, you. No problem. Dare I start another colour? The excitement! Another colour! I'm so enjoying this job. The weathered steel box is ready and the boys are adding birch trees in and around it to give the area added height and interest. That's gorgeous, because you've actually got a branch that's going to be coming out over yeah. a little bit. 
and to tie in with the industrial theme, they're using offcuts of steel as dividers down at the end of the garden. Now, these pieces of metal are offcuts from a steel fabrication company. And what they've done is they've laser cut out these shapes, but that's left this really quite ornamental framework. And they're not rusted at the moment, but over time they will weather and they will rust the same as the weathered steel. So they'll link in nicely, and I think it'll really accentuate that industrial feeling within the garden. Whilst Charlie adds bedding plants to match her Mondrian-inspired painting, and some bespoke furniture is installed in the steel box, finally the garden is finished. Gareth's troublesome sloping garden has been transformed into an uber-cool and decidedly quirky outside space. Time for its grand unveiling. Open your eyes and have a look at your garden. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> it's awesome. I can't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> it doesn't look like the same garden. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. This is <laughs> like, oh, my God. Yeah, <laughs> look at like that. that. So what do you think about the steel box? I love it. Thank you so much. Oh, it's absolutely <laughs> incredible. That lovely painting of the fence. I love that, I have to say. Now, this border is beautiful, but it's very soft and delicate with sort of silvers and purples. But if you want to get a vibrant feel to your garden, you don't have to paint the whole of the fence. You can do it with planting. So here I'm using these bright blue iris to contrast with the yellow of the rose and the bright yellow of these dahlias. Now, these dahlias are sort of treated as annuals. And the great thing about using annuals in a border is next year you can totally change the planting scheme. So rather than going with yellow and blue, I could go with yellow and red, which would give a really bright, vibrant feel to the garden, a hot, sunny feel. Now, our next garden definitely is quirky, and I think you could say opposites attract. James and Akika's garden was lacking any kind of character. It's a new build. It's a bit bland, open landscape, really. The couple wanted to inject a bit of quirky personality to the space by fusing their different cultures, Japan and Yorkshire. The Rich Brothers design did just that, linking the two with a strong use of stone throughout the garden. I thought that would be really nice because it's got a ni nice, strong affiliation with Yorkshire. The stone walls, they're beautiful, <laughs> some of the best in the world. And then with some boulders around in the middle and also a few kind of stepping stone elements. What that will do is it will create something that is obviously very kind of Japanese mm. and has that lovely kind of character. The landscaping team quickly get to work first doing the preparation for the Yorkshire-inspired dry stone walls. Just knock these little A-frames up. It's basically just the profile of the wall, so that's going to be width at the bottom, battering in, width at the top. That's going to be rough, roughly my height. So it's basically just string line all the way around, round the other one, back to this, and then we just follow that. So we'll literally just start there, follow all the way across, get a nice straight wall, hopefully. There are around 5,000 miles of dry stone walls across the Yorkshire Dales, made by tightly stacking different sized stones without mortar. It's painstaking work, but they're built to last. The oldest dry stone walls in the UK can be found in Orkney, where they date back to over 3000 BC. So the guys have made an awesome start on the stone walling and you can already see how that's helping to define the garden. It's made it feel wider, but it's also really centralised this key space in the garden. And this is where we're going to be spending the majority of the budget. And it's really where we're going to portray that fusion between Japanese and Yorkshire. Now, Yorkshire, obviously, deeply rooted with these traditional dry stone walls. But obviously with the Japanese, it's more isolated boulders and the gravel to create that zen feeling. So this space is really going to create that. But also this garden is going to come to life when we inject loads of greenery. And it's all about simple species, lots of 
of really basic but very beautiful plants that are going to help to fuse this whole space together. So we've got a simple white, very lush green. I better rush on, otherwise these guys have finished this step all <laughs> I've done anything. Right on. Oh, that's a nice one, isn't it? While the wall building continues, David and Lee are tackling another boundary. It smells lovely. They want to cover the black painted fence with bamboo screening to tie in with the Japanese theme. And at the bottom of the garden, Charlie's giving the bamboo that James and Akika planted a bit of a haircut. This one is actually a clump forming one. It's Fargesia Campbell, and it's got these lovely yellow stems. When they first come up, they're, they're sort of that nice, soft green colour. Although I'm clearing these stems, I don't want to clear them too much because I don't want to expose the wall or the trellis behind, but I do want to see the beauty of the canes themselves. In the central area, Harry's arranging the Japanese-inspired boulders. It's a lovely touch to the Japanese because they love kind of having isolated boulders set within gravel. And we wanted to kind of group them together because they have a nice kind of relationship with each other. So they almost feel like over time the stone wall might have fallen down and just left these lovely large slabs. Meanwhile, David is about to try his hand at another ancient Japanese tradition, the crafting of a bonsai tree. What I'm going to be doing is actually bonsaiing this conifer here. And then the art of bonsai is an ancient Japanese tradition. So it's basically limiting their growth by trimming the roots, manipulating and controlling the branches. I'm going to let you into a secret here. Yeah. I've never done this before. Well, the best way, <laughs> people go, oh, you go and do homework and read up and read up. But the best way to learn how to do something is actually do it. <laughs> so how are you going to tackle that, then? Well, I'm thinking, take an average pot first. Yeah. Get rid of soil. Yeah, tease the soil off. And then how, what do I do with the keep roots? The, keep the fibrous roots, because they're the ones that take the moisture up. Okay. And then the other thing you want to do is probably choose three or four main stems. Yeah. And get rid of a lot of the sort of filling bit. Yeah, because at the moment you can't see anything no, that's going on blob, there. it's a blob, isn't it? What are you planting it up? Too far. Too far? Look at this. <gasps> oh. I love a bit of too far. Tufa is a very porous limestone that's formed as a deposit from springs or streams. And I'm thinking how lovely it would be just to sit it in there. See, Tufa's really good for um, bonsais because it holds on all those little holes, hold on to moisture. From one small bonsai tree to one big Tibetan cherry tree. That's lovely. I've actually been waiting for this moment all day. And it has done me proud. So you can lead me to it now if you want. Yep. When choosing a tree for your garden, you should definitely really think about it because it can have such an impact. And especially if your garden is quite small, then that tree has to work really hard. Now, in this garden, we've got one tree. We've got this Prunus cerula, which is also known as the Tibetan cherry. And what's so great about it is that it really does show off in all the seasons. It's got a lovely flower in spring. It's then got gorgeous foliage during the summer, and then it has a little fruit then later on. But most importantly is its bark, because its bark really does become more beautiful in the winter. But when the leaves drop off and it reveals this gorgeous kind of mahogany bark, and for James and Akika, hopefully they will not only love the bark, but also love the blossom in spring, which is something widely celebrated in Japan. So I think this is going to have a gorgeous place here and really celebrate the seasons. With the Tibetan cherry in place and the whole team mucking in for some last-minute planting, the garden is finished. It was a boring, bland back garden that has been transformed into a quirky yet calming East meets West space. Time to show James and Akika. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> no way! Gosh! Wow! That, that is... Wow. I, don't, yeah, I, just, I love the fact that you had the, the stone walls as well. Mm. It's just, I can't believe this is my garden. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs>
Oh, that was great, that garden, I have to say. But then you're partial to the odd dry stone wall, aren't you, Harry? <laughs> yeah, I, I do love it. <laughs> and uh, actually, the garden ends up looking quite classy, but also a little bit quirky. Oh, a bit quirky, yeah. When it comes to oddball garden ornaments, I think there's a clear winner. Do you remember your very oh. own Charlie Dimmock the Gnome? <laughs> How could I forget? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Still a little bit lippy on here. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, before you painted it, <laughs> <laughs> it looked all right. Uh, I'll never get you to do my makeup. Now it looks great. <laughs> now, if I remember rightly, that was Nikki in Royal Wooden Bassett, yeah? That's the one, yeah. She's made a journey all the way down to come see you again. Just to say hello. <laughs> no. Say hello. Yeah, all right, hello, Charlie. <laughs> it's like looking in the mirror, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, well, perhaps we'll forget about the Charlie gnome, but I have to say the garden was a triumph. Yeah. Our final top of the plot's quirky transformation was for Nikki, who shared her home and lifeless garden with her four teenage children and a band of cheeky chappies. This is my collection of gnomes. Um, some of them are newer ones, so the kids have bought me some of these for Mother's Day. And these ones up here are the ones that I've inherited from grandparents and my mother. The garden at the moment is a little bit depressing. The only thing that's bright and jolly is, is the gnomes. They're the things that are cheerful in the garden. Nothing else is cheerful at all. The little people were very much part of the family. Hello! Hello! Hello and hello. I see we have another, this is my another judge, do we? <laughs> <laughs> and despite the boys' best efforts, Charlie's gnome know-how won through. In this bank here, I've got some little decks for your gnomes to stand. Oh, how lovely. With maybe a little bit of planting round, so they've got their own little garden to maintain. <laughs> Gnome home plan in the bag, the landscaping team arrive to get the job started, but not before the garden residents are safely out of harm's way. Come on, Papa Bear. Quite big, that one, isn't it? He's a lovely, isn't he? You need a hand with that one, <laughs> don't you? Oh, mate, look at that. He is my favourite. That's because it's you, isn't it? <laughs> He's amazing. <laughs> My little friend. You've got the same grin. <laughs> hey? What's going on with this? Oh, hang on, plugs come out. What do you boys unplug this? No. no. I'm surprised you haven't finished yet, mate. I would if someone didn't keep on plugging it every five minutes. While the landscaping team battle to keep pace with the mischievous garden gnomes, outside, Charlie's waiting for the Rich Brothers. Hello, Hello boys. Hello. How goes it? It goes well. What's the addition? Well, is it a secret? But you've got no idea. All right, go on then. Let's see what you've got in there. You ready? Yeah. Drum roll, please. <laughs> <laughs> It's a Charlie gnome. Do you recognise it? I sort of do, I have to say. As you seem to have this kinmanship with the gnomes, Harry. Yeah. I think you ought to be on the gnome home. Oh, oh lucky yeah. you. Lucky indeed. Charlie wastes no time putting Harry to work on her miniature masterpiece, which she's placing on the shed wall at the front of the garden. The idea I've got is to create almost these interlinking boxes so that the gnomes can be displayed. But it's quite nice on this wall because you don't see it straight away, do you? Yeah, see, I quite like gnomes. I, I, they've got a bit of humour to them, haven't they? Yeah, they do. So I'm thinking some are here and then I'm going to just have a little display spot just up there for no. her. You know, so she can move them around and go, oh, OK, I want that one today over there and that yeah, type of thing. Yeah, it's nice to get them off the ground as well, I think, isn't yeah. it? Keen for the gnomes to make a statement in the garden, Charlie paints the wall black so they stand out while Harry measures out for their new home. Charlie, do you want to have a little look where you want the gnomes to be positioned? Yeah, oh, cool. We can't actually... Uh, maybe, actually, it might be easier if I do that and uh, that, and I can have one and across there. One across there. So one across there. Yeah. And one then, down there, maybe? Yeah, and then maybe one up there with some small ones. Yeah. Harry's not the only one catering for the little people. Kyle's busy repairing flowers for the gnome holiday home, as you do. <laughs> In the pitch, I did say to Nikki 
that I'd make a home for her gnomes, but also a little display deck. So she can take one gnome and just have it displayed. So we're going to put that just there on the mound. Just a bit of fun, make her smile. So these are the petals. And unfortunately, my piece of dowel that I've got for the stem <laughs> broke. So Kyle is having to just fix it back, fix together. It back together. So we'll have a flower on the top and we're going to have two or three of them. Know what you're doing? I'll go th thread me beads. The garden's taking shape and Harry's almost finished the gnome home. Right, Charlie. Ooh! Built oh, it. that looks light. Well, nearly all done. I've used some scaffolding boards to create the actual form of this gnome home. And it's a very easy construction. I've just pre-drilled and then screwed them all together. I've put some brackets on the back, little triangular brackets here, and that's what I'm going to fix this frame into the wall. And now that their home's in place, all the cheery gnomes can move in, including newcomer Charlie Gnome. What's that, Chaz? You don't want to be down here. The view's not very good. You want to be up there. Are you ready, Charlie? <sighs> not what I heard. You could hear it from back there. Yeah, I thought so. She's just saying she feels a bit drab around all these gnomes. Oh, I thought she wanted to be on show. I know what you want. I've got some paints. Oh, yeah. Comes to life. If uh, I'll do the light blue top, I feel. Tell you what, it's looking pretty cool. I can see they're up to no good. The gold highlights are particularly over the top. I mean, that's quite realistic, I reckon. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> With some final planting and the newly glammed up Charlie put back in position, the team are finished. Nikki's garden was bland and boring and no place for a gnome. But now it's been transformed into this elegant space for the whole family to enjoy. Do you want to open your eyes? Oh, my God. It's lovely. It's really lovely. <laughs> Is that good? That's lovely. Oh, yeah, thank you so much. Oh, dear, don't cry. You made me cry. That's just amazing. So the garden's gone down well. But what about Nikki's little friends? Oh, my God. <laughs> anything like me, but apparently it does. It's amazing. <laughs> That's fabulous. <laughs> a bit of fun. Because you said the gnomes make you laugh. Yeah, they do. They absolutely do. Well, Charlie, I've got to say, that garden looked fantastic. <laughs> it did, and with all those gnomes, <laughs> who'd have thought? <laughs> Well, it does go to show that, you know, gardens aren't just about plants, trees, patios, lawns. It's actually about getting your inner quirkiness into your garden. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we do hope you've enjoyed looking back at some of our favourite quirky gardens. And we'll see you next time for some more Top of the Plots.